We are probably one of the last generations of Homo sapiens, because in the coming generations, we will learn how to engineer bodies and brains and minds. Now, how exactly will the future masters of the planet look like? This will be decided by the people who own the data. Now, why is data so important? It's important because we've reached the point when we can hack not just computers, we can hack human beings and other organisms. Hey guys, George Mesa here, Third Eye Edify podcast. And we just heard something there from Yuval Noah Harari, who is a transhumanist for sure, and a member of the World Economic Forum, which should be no surprise to anyone listening to this. And if it is, I highly suggest doing a little research on the World Economic Forum. They've been pulling some strings for a very long time. And even in that quote you just heard, uh, overlords or whatever you want to call them, the powers that should not be, he mentions them. He's aware. They're all aware of it. And I'm here to help you become aware of things you probably didn't know about that were hiding in plain sight, right in front of your eyes, right underneath your nose. And whether it's you who are engrossed into a digital world or your children, it's not as harmless as it seems. And for the entirety of this program today, I will be coming from a place of experience. I was that guy. All I did is play video games. All I did is wait for the next technology. That way I could also be closer to that, what's called the singularity that Ray Kurzweil so eloquently placed in his work and his, uh, he's basically a philosophy. It's basically a religion to be followed. Singularity being that point where man and machine are, are one. And much like this previous comment you just heard in the opening, um, homo sapien no more. If that's something you'd like to believe. It's incredible what has happened. So much has changed, and yet it was all there all along. This idea of transhumanism. The idea of a transhuman being, again, just a conspiracy theory. Some science fiction gobbledygook. It, you know, wrapped up in novels, wrapped up in film and movies. But the more you look at these films and movies, you see, and, and books, you see that everything they wrote about is not only here, but it's exactly the same in some respects. That is the nature and the power of predictive programming. Something along the lines of a thing I've mentioned in the past, you have to invite the vampire in for his power to work over you. And keep this in mind, too. Mice never really see their trap. They just see cheese. I wouldn't necessarily call that a Trojan horse. But a lot of these things are often brought into the public in a good light. Much like the mobster who donates to charity to have a good public image, these things are often brought in as cures for certain things. We're going to look at the Neuralink from Tesla, from Elon Musk, um, you know, that's made to help with, br you know, brain problems. Um, it, if, it, if it can do that, obviously it's a good thing. If you don't have a leg and you, ha you get a replacement leg, this is amazing. We really do want that. If that leg is a smart meter type thing that, you know, finds everywhere that you are and knows what you're doing all the time. And that's not a good thing. This is what I mean by Trojan horse. A lot of these things are brought in as what is supposed to be something great and good for humanity. And it's often going to lead to many other things. And it's out in the open. The World Economic Forum and places like it are always telling you what's going on. You just have to go look for it. It's not really said in a lot of these kinds of forums that we saw uh, in the beginning and other things like it. But when you go to their own website and look at their own things, you see it right away. And we're going to check out a lot of that stuff coming up. But you saw the thumbnail to this video, Transformers. 
are you a robot in disguise? That may seem like a bold statement, but I don't think that it is. Do you have a phone on you? Are you watching this on a phone? Thank you for watching, by the way. This is not trying to tell you to throw your phone out the car window or out of your three-story apartment window right now. But just think about it. If you, as a human being, are not only quick to grab your phone for information and advice and anything, directions, spelling, things you can get by asking other people, things you can get from encyclopedias and books, knowledge you can acquire and keep on your own, or have you looked at your phone for something you already knew? Have you used your phone just by instinct, just by the nature of the way it's developed in our culture, in our society? Did you ever grab a phone to find out or confirm something you already knew? This is the nature of a cyborg. This phone, it's not inside of you. It's not implanted into you. Of course, people do have that already. Chips, brain implants, these things exist already. And some would say that you may even have other things injected into you. Nanobots, things of that nature. You think I'm just spitting out random nonsense? I'm going to show you people that like to tell you that these things are happening and that they're going to be useful for you and for society as a whole. Now, again, are you a cyborg? Obviously, you're not some Terminator, half-man, half-machine, where your whole skeletal structure is this indestructible, you know, modern technology robot. I'm not saying that. But think about this. As long as you have battery and a signal, you know way more than you actually know. What's the capital of Uzbekistan? Maybe you don't know that offhand. Boom, your phone has the answer. Now, that's an arbitrary idea, of course. But it's there. It's there. And again, as long as it's charged. And how many of you worry about your phone being charged every day? We're used to it now. They keep talking about how the, elect the electric cars are a waste of time and effort. You have to go charge them. You can't get back in. If the battery dies, you have to buy a battery just to open the thing up again. There's faults. Maybe they're on purpose. Maybe they're not. I don't think big oil is ready to just get rid of um, their, <laughs> their businesses just like that. But again, charging your phone and getting used to that kind of lifestyle is just one way that they get you ready for what's coming. You don't have to charge your own battery, technically speaking, as a human. But you do sleep. You do energize yourself there's that thing called the second wind there's ways where you can find reserve battery power power so to speak i don't want to put it into those terms because i'm against that of course the idea that we're computers or machines we may behave similarly but we are by no means any of that stuff and we don't have to be plugged in to an electric circuit to be charged up you have to eat right and take care of yourself and get out in the sun a thing that is extremely hard to do nowadays, by design, I would say. Believe me, I know more than most. I really do. Hey, want to go hiking? No, I'd rather stay inside and play video games all day. Thank you very much. Which restaurant should we go to? Which one has the better arcade again? That was me. That was definitely me. If you chose a restaurant or a movie theater based on which arcades they had, then you were primed up to be this person. I was definitely supposed to be this person. I went to school for computer science. I was ready to make video games. I'm not saying video games are evil, but I truly believe that the way video games have evolved recently into the way that phone games behave and the kind of, I don't even want to call it an arcade, the kind of, you know, crazy reward for minimal effort some rewards are just for turning the game if you want to call it a game just for opening the app you get rewards and and you know i always hear from younger students of mine things like oh i made a i got a billion points today and i'm like that's great is that a lot some games a billion might not be a lot it's just they like to show you big huge numbers so you feel like you're doing something but 
a lot of times those games don't have a lot of effort involved into getting better at them or succeeding any goals. Back in the day, you had to get good at the game to beat it. I was often asked for advice or to actually do something like, I can't get past this part. Can you do it for me? This is, whether or not any of that is good or bad or if you grew up with it or not, that is a wonderful thing, actually. Hey, come over to my house. You have to beat this part of this game for me. It's like asking somebody to come over and help you put together a huge heavy dresser or to help you move or something. This is community. This is communication. Arcades, video game arcades, used to be this wonderful place where you could go, you could hang out in this dingy, poorly lit, no bathroom available, you know, bunker where <laughs> there were some arcade cabinets and you, you hung out with your, your group. You got together there. You met there physically. You shared information, tips, ideas. Hey, oh, I, I noticed you can do this at this one part, whatever. I'm, I'm simplifying all this, but those days are long gone. There may be a few arcades here and there, but they're really just kind of like places to hang out uh, with your kids and kind of relive old memories or a place to have your teenagers hang out while you go shopping, which is kind of what arcades were in most uh, malls. But the idea of that community is long gone. I even wrote an ethnography on the arcade scene at the beginning of the 2000s in a class I was taking in college, and... It was the community I knew. It was a community. And now everything's online. And you can just sit at home and do it. What do you think the metaverse is? The metaverse is not going to subvert video game playing. It's going to subvert and almost eradicate, in my opinion, all social contact of any kind. Meetings, work in general, family occasions, birthday parties. I'm thankful it didn't escalate that quickly, but it seemed like it was going to when everyone was stuck at home on Zoom meetings all the time just to say hello for happy birthday. I was a little worried it was going to just stay there. But it doesn't mean that it's not going to go there. They gave us a taste. The vampire was invited in with welcome, welcome arms. We let the vampire in. And I say we collectively. I'm not saying you or me because I certainly wasn't happy about it at all and trying to let people know but I hope people don't get complacent and start to think that oh we're back to normal everything's great we're not even close to being back to normal the trajectory just shot through the roof as far as pushing these kinds of things what is the metaverse it's got little atheistic aesthetic to it I'd say And much like the idea of a Gnostic demiurge where there's this creator of all things and it's not exactly a good thing, this exists in the video game world. It's a world created just for you. It has its rules. You can learn how to manipulate them to get better at the game. And the metaverse is the same thing. There's going to be very rigid, um, simple restrictions because it is simple at its heart. It doesn't look really very fantastic. The graphics aren't anything to, you know, to write home about. And that's how it works when you have huge uh, worlds like this. The graphics have to suffer, of course. But it's not about graphics. People aren't going to be wowed by the metaverse. They're going to be wowed by what they can do in it. And it's going to, I hope it doesn't, but it's going to quickly become the de facto standard for how we interact with other people. No need to leave your house. You'll feel drained without it. You put on a headset where you can only see what's provided for you. And who makes those headsets? Who's responsible for all this? I said metaverse a few times. Facebook is now either changed completely or owned by the new company called Meta. They weren't purchased by anybody. They're still Facebook, still Instagram. It's still the Fang, Facebook, Apple, Netflix, Amazon, Google. These are the F-A-N-G, right? It's still the Fang. But now Meta actually owns the rights to Oculus. You may have heard of the Oculus, which is a headset. Um, Meta has purchased it now. Now Meta owns that. So the Metaverse will be primarily viewed by wearing the Meta Oculus. 
I haven't even looked at my notes yet. I'm just going on everything I know. Because I know a good amount of this stuff. I really do. Um, this idea of what I said earlier, this atheistic aesthetic. A, a fun little catchphrase to kind of describe what's happening here. Because this truly is starting to fall in line with the concepts of a religion, the concepts of a philosophy. Many of these books that are written by these people, Ray Kurzweil, Harari, who, was, who you saw at the beginning here, they're, they don't read like casual stuff. They're made for everyone to read because they don't often have the kinds of you know endless numbers inside of them like some of these other people, Richard Dawkins, um, Galileo, people like that. They're not, they're not really written in these very hard-to-approach kind of you need a scholastic mindset and or actually be involved in that world to understand the book. Well, they're made for the common person to take it all in. And it's written in a very philosophical way. It's written in a very um, religious almost way. And a lot of times things are, as often they are, Things are provided as facts, and they're not really given any kind of factual background other than their own concept based on either modern science or, and of course, they pick and choose which ones they want, or statistics. There's a great book called How to Lie with, with Statistics. I'm sure some of you have heard of that. It's a pretty popular one. Compared to a lot of the other books I'm reading, which aren't really very popular for a number of reasons, I'm sure. Um, a lot of baggage here. I just laid down a lot of stuff. But the most important thing out of this little, what I would call an intro to this episode, is that you have a phone on on you all the time. And it kind of makes you a cyborg. When you use social media, you are not putting a headset on to lose your surroundings and become part of this metaverse, but you are in the metaverse uploading everything you think, every time you type, every picture you show. Your life exists in a cloud as it does on your wall, whether it be Facebook or whatever other social media app you use. You don't get away from it. No matter which one you use, you're in the system. You're in it. And again, in that quote in the beginning, he's mentioning that who is in power? The one that has all the data. You keep uploading your data, and much like the amazing um, Corbett report, said in a, in a video that he made data is the new oil data is the most valuable thing to all of these people not just a sample of your blood that they grab right from birth not just your scholastic record goods and bads this is much now a much deeper kind of pe peering through the looking glass Breaking the fourth wall, seeing the typer, seeing the story maker. You make your own story on these things. And you're confident that you're safe because of that? I don't think so. I don't think so. And you should think about it if you haven't. Because all of those things are one way that they get all of your information. Now, this brings up a lot of other things. Because that's being transhuman as well. Just having a Facebook profile makes you transhuman in a certain way. How is that? You have a digital identity. It's actually your own view of your digital self that you create willingly for free, by the way. And it is very valuable this free thing that you have. You essentially create a website of yourself with no repercussions, really. You can say and do whatever you want. Although I know sometimes with interviews for certain jobs and, you know, if you're a teacher and you post certain things and word gets out, you could easily lose your job. That's a whole different story. That's a whole different, I agree, disagree with, whole different thing altogether. You have a digital identity. And what does identity actually mean? I looked at a bunch of definitions. I always do, as you know. I've got a few here, but 
Um, one of the most interesting ones I found was definition number five in the Black's Law Dictionary, the authenticity of a person or thing. The authenticity of a person or thing is identity. In that regard, I would think that something like a social media profile can actually be null and void because I could, you can buy someone's profile. I personally have around 2,000 or more Facebook friends from when I used to use it all the time. I reopened it recently just to help me get this thing going, actually. I don't use it for any other reason. I don't even like my friends, my wife, my family members. I don't touch it. I don't touch it. It's not because I'm holier than thou. I'm just avoiding it at all costs. I'm using it for my own person. I'm using it as a tool for my own personal, potentially my own personal gain right now. It's a business move. But somebody could tell me, hey, you have 2,000 friends. Can I buy your account? That way when I use my thing, I'll, they'll all see it. People do this. Automatically, we don't have we don't have confirmation of the actual identity. Anyone can use any account. People make five, six, seven accounts of their own on Twitter just so they can be different people, just so they can say certain things and not interrupt the flow of the other person's wall, whatever they call it. Um, think about that. The etymology of identity is actually quite different. Um, it was actually, at one point, about 600 years ago, it meant sameness. And I think what it means by that is because identity is almost an outward projection. If you are providing the identity that actually is equal to who you are, we've completely eradicated that successfully, I'd say, through the technological age that we're in now, the internet age and the way that it's used now. I would assume, at least around in the Western world here, Facebook, YouTube, is anything used more than that? Maybe Facebook isn't the primary one anymore. Maybe Twitter or Instagram is being used more. Either way, Instagram and Facebook, are they really any different? I don't see that. But social media, YouTube, is there anything else? Maybe it's becoming harder to use the internet for things that I'd like to use it for, researching things. I have to rely on all these books because... It's harder than ever to find things, believe me. And that is a product of design. It's also a product of input. And output, I would say. Controlled output, controlled distribution. If Google, just for the sake of argument, bought every book there is, how many, what percentage of those books do you think would be widely distributed throughout the internet after that? Do you think every single book ever? would be gladly distributed? I don't think so. It's not like the Ray Bradbury book where we burned all the books. It's more of a modern-day book burning where not only is the book gone, but there is no record of it ever having existed. Not on the Internet we use. That is very scary. And I hope it gives you something to think about because I'm just getting started with this topic. The idea of transhuman is becoming legally viable. It has already, but it's really starting to make its way into the public conscious, the public sphere, probably on purpose. And there's a lot to worry about in my honest opinion, as far as that, um, let me see if I missed anything extremely important here. Um, think about this, because this is going to come up too, is that your digital identity, at the very least, will technically live forever. As I was rolling through my Facebook settings, recently I couldn't help but notice that there's a section for you to now, as a living person who has your Facebook account, you can now determine what happens after you die with your Facebook account. How would you like us to continue yourself once you have died? Facebook is asking you this question. That's transhuman. 
that transcends your life. And Facebook, Meta, let's not call it Facebook anymore. It's Meta now. Meta is asking you, what do you want us to do with you when you die? They're not going to be at your funeral, but they're definitely going to keep your data. And that's just the beginning. How many times have you clicked agree in your life since the internet age? I would hazard to say myself personally, at least a thousand at least a thousand, if, especially if you include all those, do you want to use cookies every time you go to a website? Cookies, allow, yes. How many times have you clicked agree? Every single time you're giving in to all the things that I'm talking about, whether you realize it or not. And I'm assuming a lot of you do realize it. I have much faith in this audience. Trust me. Or don't trust me. Go look this stuff up on your own. Please do. Um, I, I, what I haven't done that I'd like to do is provide books that I've used as references in my show notes. I will certainly be referencing books, and I will certainly give you uh, links to things like the video I showed earlier and the video I'm going to show later. I will certainly be providing more links in my show notes, so that way you can look at everything I'm looking at. If I provide an article, I will absolutely give you a link to that. So always do look in the show notes. And leave some comments, too, if you feel like it. Um, there's just so much to discuss here. It's absolutely incredible. And I'm thinking for my next episode or somewhere in the next week or two, this idea of dropping your heroes, the people you grew up just admiring at the very least. I keep finding out that they're doing weird stuff behind the scenes. And it's pretty painful for me, honestly. But that's just the way things are now. It really is. And um, in conclusion of the living forever thing, there is way more to that story. As we'll talk near the end about hacking, genes, gene editing, it's usually called. Edit as in computer stuff, obviously. They, they turn all the lingo into computer lingo when they talk about us, human beings. We're not computers. And I think I've made that abundantly clear several times, but I want to make sure I don't give it up because think about it, really. Um, I want to live forever means you don't believe in overpopulation. Just to begin with, if you are saying that people can live forever forever through gene editing, then you're clearly not worried about overpopulation. And that's just the start of the contradictions I hope to address here today. Because that's something that bothers me just a little bit. When they talk about climate change, overpopulation, we're the problem. Ted Turner thinks there's too many of us. Go look it up. It's not good. It's not healthy. Human beings do what they do. We've always done what we do. We will continue to do so. And all this digital defecation over our species, is it's got to stop. It's crazy. It's got to stop. Little rant there. Sorry about that. Um, I think this thing hit full swing in the 90s because that's when I know that video games, um, movies, television, they really were just all constantly there. I'm not sure if there was TV at night in the 80s, but there, you know, past midnight, let's say, but there definitely was in the 90s. And um, I was there. I was there watching it. I was. If I wasn't sleeping and I snuck to the TV, I was watching something. And keep in mind that um, as far as these headsets, I wanted to mention this earlier when I mentioned the Oculus, which was purchased by Meta for you know $2 billion in 2014. It's a long time ago that they were trying to th- get these headsets going. They've tried them many times, but they were never very good. They're getting much better now. Um, they have, and I didn't know that it was judged this way, so that's why I'm looking at my notes as particularly as I am. Um, you get pixels per eye, right? Pixels per degree. And each eye has a certain amount as you're looking through because there's two places for your eyes to look when you use these headsets. Um, They're getting pretty huge. And apparently humans have a 60 pixels per degree limit. This is for each eye. So think about that. These goggles are trying to anticipate how much they're trying to use and utilize the extremes of human design when they're making these things. Now that, of course, as it always does, sounds like the logical best idea. 
But the closer these things get to reality, and I assume it will take a while for the headset to do that. There's got to be a better way, and they'll get there, I'm sure. But the closer they get to that, the more people are going to want to use it, the more people are going to be doing it for way too many hours every day. Take the headset off, it's nighttime, all of a sudden you had no idea. That kind of thing. At least when I'm playing games through the night, I can start hearing the birds chirping in the morning, and I know it's maybe time to start thinking about stopping <laughs> the old me, that is. But um, th- just, again, think about that. Th- these lenses often have three different settings as well, distant settings, and they kind of judge how much of your sides you can see. They kind of squeeze you in to a tunnel vision of sorts. And I'm mentioning this because I think this happens when people are on their cell phones. When you're doing this, it's pretty much tunnel vision. You can't see anything around you. You see the phone. And you start to lose track of what you're hearing all around you. The ears do something called masking, which I believe I've mentioned. And if you're in a busy restaurant, you won't hear every single table while you're talking to somebody at your own table. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to hear anything. You don't hear blood pumping in your ears. This is on purpose by design. When you have your cell phone, I feel like everything gets masked. You're too focused on this tunnel vision. The headset is going to exponentially increase that tunnel vision. These are all things that are coming very soon. So who created the Oculus? Great question. Um, It was John Carmack who had a big hand in it working for this company, Zenimax. As far as the Oculus, there's other ones. As far as the Oculus is concerned. John Carmack is one half of the team ID, ID, who was most popular for making one of the most important games of all time, Doom, which came out in 1994. And um, John Carmack went on after this, and I think I'll talk a little bit about Doom in a second. He went to make his own aerospace company, um, Armadillo Aerospace. They were looking to do some low or uh, low orbit, <laughs> sorry, low Earth orbit stuff. Um, you know, getting people to travel kind of like Virgin Galactic, kind of like what Blue Origin's trying to do, where you can get people into not space per se, but pretty high up. Uh, I keeps falling through as far as I can tell. Go look it up yourself if you're not uh, sure. They often sell tickets even. I remember Virgin was selling tickets. And I think it was the 90s even. And they just got refunded because it didn't happen. The project never happens. They're working on getting rid of windows from airplanes. Why? What don't they want you to see when you're as high up as you can possibly be? We'll save that for another episode, I think. Of course. <laughs> um, you know, again, as far as dropping your heroes, I really loved Doom, and I played it, I couldn't even tell you how much. I remember a teacher that I had in junior high who will remain nameless. She had a gateway, one of those new gateway computers, and they were certainly pretty popular when they were coming out. So this must have been like 95. It's probably like 95. And she was allowing people to come in and play Doom 2, which computers basically just came with at that point. Um, And I wonder, as I was doing this, I thought to myself, did she know... That game is overtly satanic just because it's tongue-in-cheek. Kind of like the way Cannibal Corpse, the death metal band, has the most disturbing lyrics, but they're all married with kids. They don't truly believe in that. They just use it as their... It's what they do. Does the person that made the Friday the 13th series with hockey mask Jason Killer, do you think that person is you know a murderous, evil person? I really doubt it. I highly doubt it. Those movies just had a lot of comedy in them. They're pretty silly. Doom is very tongue-in-cheek. It's very silly. It knows it. But Doom 2, which is the one that she had, was called Hell on Earth. And as with most Doom games, at first you start out in pretty standard-looking facility-type places, and eventually you get to the levels that either take place in Hell or places that have been just taken over by, you know, demons. Um, and there is a lot of satanic imagery. 
I wonder if this teacher knew. No one ever played long enough to get to those later levels, so I don't think anyone saw it. If she knew that was in there, I don't think she would be letting little kids play uh, Doom. <laughs> I just, I highly doubt it, but who knows? Maybe, maybe, maybe she didn't care. I certainly didn't care, and it didn't make me an evil person. I thought the game was really fun and well-made. But, again, here's John Carmack now. The story of Doom is interesting because it took place on Mars with some interdimensional portals where the army was using it, uh, Mars and its moons, as a nuclear waste facility. Is this all predictive programming? The interdimensional portals, that remains to be seen or proven or whatever. But as far as nuclear waste on Mars, that kind of happens. There's probes that go to Mars. They have nuclear batteries. And um, we are bringing nuclear things to Mars, apparently bringing nuclear things to Mars. I'm, I don't believe it. I just don't. And the proof isn't very good. And again, maybe that's potentially for another uh, episode. But, you know, one more thing that came up when I was looking for th that that Ar um, Armadillo Aerospace, that's a defunct company now. And um, who knows why. But maybe they found out they couldn't go <laughs> do what they wanted to do. It was impossible. Who knows? We certainly haven't gone back since we apparently went at the end of the 60s. So maybe it's still, like they say, space is hard. Is that why they destroyed all of the technology and telemetric data? I don't know. I can't say and I won't say right now. But at age 14, Carmack um, brought a few kids around to steal some Apple computers from school. How did he get in? He used a combination of thermite and Vaseline. Thermite! To break through some windows. Now, obviously, this is an educated thing to do if you are looking to do that kind of thing. Maybe he had the Anarchist Cookbook. I have a feeling that's where this came from because that was being popularized around that time. Anarchist Cookbook. Oh, my God. Everyone's buying it and making bombs. But... Where was thermite used? Anyone? Yeah, the World Trade Center. So I think that's an interesting little parallel there that I found um, nothing out of the ordinary. This happens all the time when you research stuff. You find so many sinks with all these different things. So, you know, I, I found that Armadillo Aerospace had tried to... They entered this, you know, what's we'll called a contest to make a lunar lander. And NASA funded this. Hey, make us a lunar lander. The best one might actually go to the moon. <laughs> Why don't they make their own? I don't understand it. Maybe somebody can hit me up in the comments and tell me what I'm missing here. Why can't NASA make their own stuff? And why can't they make it all in one facility? Am I venturing from the transhuman conversation? Not necessarily. DARPA, NASA... These are all military industrial complex type things, and they're all pushing for this transhuman thing. You think the 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 military doesn't want cyborgs for war? You think they don't want enhanced human beings to go and be the better team, whatever you want to call it? Who raises their flag higher? Cyborg will. <laughs> are you going to beat a cyborg in a not in a physical match, certainly not. Maybe they can handle the weapons you have, too. A gun won't even matter. A bomb, not good for close range. It's a lot to think about as far as warfare is concerned. War is very often the creator of much of these things. Going back to the beginning of the history of video games, it's the same thing. It's all funded by the same people. It's all coming from the same colleges. And um, this episode and episodes on video games and things like it certainly won't just be one episode. I've got a lot more to talk about, and um, there's just so much to get to here. Um, this reminds me... Think about this. Things go obsolete. At the base level of conversation with problems that may occur, with putting a chip in your brain, the Neuralink, let's say, from Tesla, which I'll show you some pictures of very soon, What's one of the big problems here? I started reading Ray Kurzweil's The Age of Spiritual Machines, 
I've had the book for a while, actually, and I never opened it up, but I was, I know that it has a lot to do with what I'm discussing. And um, early on, it talks about the seven phases of technology, the seven steps of life cycle of a technology. The final step is obsolescence, obsolescence. And it's, it's interesting how things seem to have a forced obsolescence in this modern technological age. Some of you may know that 3G is being phased out right now. This is forced obsolescence. They were still using it for lots of things. Lots of different things, as a matter of fact. So why get rid of it? Why, why shove it aside all of a sudden? I don't know. But I remember there was the uh, analog to digital you know, TV, the digital transition in the U.S. and for the broadcasting of terrestrial television. And that was 6-12-2009. Hey, that, I'm not going to go there, but it does add up to 9-11. Um, that was forced obsolescence for your televisions. No more tube televisions, guys. No more CRT, cathode ray tube. I liked them. I thought they were great. Yeah, they were a little heavy. But everything looked great on them. Now we've got the smart TVs, and yeah, things look great. But too many options, too many ways to mess with your picture. And I think a lot of households don't have their TV looking right because it takes so much more work to even approach it. For them to say everything's digital, everything's HD from now on. Everything's going to be a smart TV. You think your phones are listening to you? Your smart TV is too. Your smart fridge is also. Your smart toaster. Everything's listening. If you have one of those Alexa units in your house, those Amazon things, it's listening. And it's constantly showing you things that you don't need to see. Updates on, you know, the news they want you to know about. Silly, nonsensical questions that don't add to your life at all. But Alexa thinks it's a really good idea to learn. Alexa, is, is Alexa in your house right now? Is she not your little robot companion? The transhuman world is here. It's a matter of how fast it's going to es escalate. And I would say eschatologically speaking it's escalating very very quickly and much more quickly than you might think as I hope to prove by the end of this episode with a uh, recent thing that was passed off by the president an executive order from Joe Biden and I'll show you that on the screen in a little bit um, you know I wrote this down it wasn't necessarily part of the conversation here but Something that came up as I was doing more research for video games about two years ago is that most psychologists don't agree that gaming disorder belongs on the ICD, which is the uh, International Classification of Disorders. They said it's just, the kids will be fine. You know, if you don't think that gaming addiction is real, ask anyone, that's always on their cell phone. Whether they're playing games or not, social media, that is a game. You scroll through it, you get benefits from doing it a certain way. You earn more friends by doing certain things. If you click certain buttons and certain likes a lot, you get more coming in your direction. There's a risk-reward thing going on. It's a video game. It's 100% a video game. It's not played like one. It doesn't feel like one. And that's why it's so amazingly smart, but the people that made it. It really keeps you in it. There's no video game that could ever keep you in it that many hours a day. Um, not one that you wouldn't think, oh my God, I got to stop playing video games. I got to go do something. <laughs> think about that. Think about it for a second, please. Don't worry, the kids will be fine. Gaming disorder doesn't belong on the ICD. Of course it doesn't. Neither would phone addiction, right? It's up to family members. It's up to friends to help each other not fall victim to this completely opposite from nature lifestyle. Yes, I'm staring at a camera. Yes, I'm broadcasting to YouTube. But I'm doing it because that's where everyone is and I may have the most impact there. I truly feel like I'm on a mission here. And that may sound cocky, but I'm doing it out of the pureness of my heart. I feel like there's a lot of problems. And some big, scary things on the horizon. That are Some of them are already here. 
And I think that's the reason people don't know. They're waiting for that big announcement, like transhumanism. <laughs> it's plenty in the public sphere. You just have to go looking for it. They, they hide it certain ways. Believe me. Because I'm looking for it. I'm looking for it. Can you surpass and exceed your creator? Whether you believe in creation or not, it doesn't mean you're Christian or any religion. It doesn't mean that you're that. To think that there may be intelligent design here. It doesn't mean that you're some religious crazy person. It just means you have a lot of questions that aren't being sufficiently answered by technology and science. It means you have valid questions that people won't even look at. And that should be suspicious to you. But with things like the metaverse and things, well, like video games in general, things like what the transhumanists are saying, they're trying to tell you that we are going to exceed our own selves. If you create something, do you think it's going to supersede its creator? When you make any kind of, they're all binary, any kind of binary system, any kind of computer, do you really think it's going to supersede your brain? Do you think we're going to construct a brain? Do you think we're going to construct two beings that can create another being? I really, really don't think so. Male and female required to create life. That's how we work. This is the law of our world. And prove me wrong, please. Um, did I have anything else to say here? I don't think so. Just remember that most don't truly represent themselves in their digital identity. And um, as inauthentic as that is, it's on purpose, in my opinion. It's definitely on purpose. Now, what do you have memorized? Do you have as much memorized as you used to? And I'm not talking about sports. I'm just talking about everyday things. Whether it's converting ounces to pounds or... <laughs> that's not really a thing, but... Whether it's converting Celsius to Fahrenheit or a phone number of a family member or a friend or just some bit of knowledge you used to have that you don't bother with anymore. How do you justify taking down your own ability as a human being just because we have this almost limited, <laughs> limitless, it's limited, this limitless knowledge in our pocket you have the phone on you you don't even have to press anything you can talk into it and it can send a message a sterile flaccid message to somebody else a digital print of what you said with no accents no change in voice no cadence to the way you speak none of that exclamation point happy face it's about as good as it's going to be we have dumbed ourselves down to take entire phrases and turn them into acronyms. LOL. Haha, -ha, how funny was it? I can't tell. All I saw was LOL. <laughs> it's kind of crazy. And it's another big part of it. You don't need to type. Kids don't know how to write script. Kids barely know how to type at all in the QWERTY keyboard. There's no buttons on the new phones. They don't even have a button. This makes things less easy to access. More difficult to do certain things if you don't use the easiest way to do it, which is to just talk. Give me your voice. Give me, give me, give me. Like Ariel <laughs> um, losing her voice in The Little Mermaid. Give me your voice. Give it to me, and I'll give you whatever you want. I'll deform you from a mermaid into a person. How much do you give to your phone? How much is it taking from you? And how much do you rely on it? As long as you have battery and signal, you can do almost anything. There's people that walk around with headphones on so they can watch their shows all day 
while they do everything they do on a regular basis. If they have the kind of job where they can do that, great. But they all, they'll walk into a restaurant. They'll walk into a restaurant, sit down at the bar with headphones on, and watch entire programs while gambling. This is real life. People are so immersed in that world that they almost can't leave it. They have to be in it. And they only put it away when it's time to watch sports. And sports advertisements have been up heavily lately, I'd say. And that's probably something to do with it. But what other kinds of advertisements have been up on the up and up lately? I'll tell you. That is outer space, army, Hollywood, Star Wars, Lord of the Rings. Uh, what else is lately? Anything Disney's doing. We're coming up to October. There's lots of witch things happening. We'll be saving a real special one for the end of October, I assure you. So, just Google it. <laughs> you don't even have to know how to spell anymore. Just let the phone do it. Hopefully you can still spell rhinoceros. But then you've got certain words. Are there two N's or two L's? I don't remember. How often has that happened now? This would not be a problem if we were still in the natural way. And we're just not. I guess what I'm getting at is we are cyborgs. And we, f we agreed to it. We spend money we don't even see. Our digital wallets are ejaculating dollar bills everywhere you go. Money isn't even physical anymore. I had Dan Bailey on last week. It was an incredible interview. That man, um, I've seen him do his thing with bartering. Not everyday things. Well, maybe sometimes, but hardly for everyday things. But you can, there are ways around currency. If you have something to offer and someone else has something to offer that needs your thing, you can get their thing and you give them your thing. Bartering. There's so many ways to do it. People are so not into buying used things. If someone's done with a crib, a baby crib, they're never going to need it again, probably. It's time for somebody else to use that item. It's not time for Amazon to ship another one. How easy is it to buy something from Amazon? And how often have you been disappointed in that product? There's probably somebody right down the road making that product by hand, from scratch, that has a family that could really use that purchase. Or barter. <laughs> Go see what they're up to. This is what transhumanism leads to. You don't need anything you used to need. And as far as Mr. Harari is concerned, as we'll see at the very end, you're not needed. Humans aren't needed. Not like they used to be, he said. I'll show you later. This, I guess it was mentioned, but, you know, think, just put this in the back of your mind as you do things on your day-to-day. -day. How often do you actually talk to your phone like it's a person? How often do you talk to your phone? Hey, what's up? Maybe it's not that. But it's like, hey, what's for dinner tonight? Think about that. People ask their phone, what's for dinner? The phone's not cooking it. The phone doesn't even care. And Siri, backwards, we were talking about Alexa earlier, Siri for the iPhones, that's Iris backwards. It's looking right at you. Keep that in mind. The Department of Education... Where to begin with that? Um, they are taking a humongous part in this. And I really hope that you take that to heart. Is every teacher going to be replaced by a robot? 
I really don't think so. Are there robots made to accompany teachers and to take off the menial workload of grading papers and handing out things, and putting away the jackets? Yes. Maybe not so much in the U.S., but there's robots. They're here. And keep it in mind. I mean, we're talking about a happy-faced robot just waiting for you and your children at home. I'm sorry, <laughs> waiting for you and your children at school. It's going to become more and more prevalent. They're being used in hospitals. They're being used as police officers. Pl try pleading your case to a robot police officer. See what happens. They're being used in schools. And they're being used in the household too. You may or may not have seen this robot. This is Moxie, M-O-X-I-E. And I'm definitely not going to show the little uh, movie that they made to promote it, but also happened to be one of the very uh, most, one of the very first mass-produced soft drinks in the U.S. Moxie. Um, you, if you don't know what Moxie is, I really suggest that you do go look it up. The way that the commercial that I saw is, it's almost like an act of desperation. They're clearly trying to show that the kid doesn't really want to talk to his parents that much. He's sitting in his room doing a little something doodle. They're like, hey, Tyler, whatever his name is. And he's just like, yep. You know, doesn't look at them. And they whip out this robot. The face is a screen. It's not really an animated, like, robot face. It's a harmless-looking thing. Sure it is. You can buy or rent this robot, by the way. And it's there to help your child grow to help them learn how to spell, to help them learn how emotions work, have a little sleeping buddy, have a friend. And in this commercial, they show the kid talking to the robot under a table, kind of like secret, away from the parents. The robot says, tell me what's wrong. The kid says, this one kid at school, he just doesn't like me. And I, li I think he's my friend, and I, he doesn't like me, or something like that. And the robot says... I love it when people squeeze my hand. Thanks for sharing your day with me. This is not what robots are for. And unfortunately, this is not what cell phones are for either. But a lot of people seem to pour their problems into social media. Way before a loved one, a friend, a wife, a husband, a grandma, is moxie really what you want in your house it worries me to death I want you to really go and look at that go take a look at Moxie everything's a mission it's never just like a fun activity it's a mission I have a mission for you that's that term gets used for a lot of different things but it's often thrown into the religious and war aspects and I think that is just a strange word to use. I really do, you know. Um, this is not, again, it's not there right now. Robots everywhere. But the way schooling has been approached since the time of Covidius Minimus, tons of Zoom learning, kids already are very acclimated to digital everything. Most of them already have a cell phone. So the next logical step is school is on the screen. Now, that hasn't happened yet, but it did already happen. We invited the vampire in, and it's going to be right around the corner. And if not, then everyone gets a digital, or, or everyone gets their own robot. Everyone gets their own moxie. Moxie is school now. Forget homeschooling. You can still go to work in the prime times that your child is awake. You can still go to work and slave yourself out on the hamster wheel and then come back home, and the robot took care of everything. It's not good. It's something to be careful about. And it's been primed up. And they are talking about it like crazy. They've been talking about it. This is not new stuff. This is old stuff. This is 20, 30, 40 years old stuff. And things like COVID pop it into existence. You get a sample of it. And I'm telling you, the kids didn't like it. Thankfully. You'd think all they wanted were video games all day. They didn't like it. 
They did want to go play kickball. They did want to see their friends. And that is a beautiful thing. Just like the emperor's new clothing, the kid had the smartest comments. And I think that we need to pay attention to what children think and say. They see the world in a very unique and open-minded way. Often uncluttered. And everything I'm saying is not 100% across the board, of course. Um, so, as I was looking again at the beginning of The Age of Spiritual Machines from Ray Kurzweil, who is highly regarded in this category, very highly regarded as a matter of fact, he claims that evolution for tech advances quickly. And his his claim is that we evolve into it as in you know darwinian evolution we're better at computers now because we've already started evolving into them i debate that and i say that if a kid is born surrounded by computer tech they're going to be better at it naturally by the time they're five or ten not because their ancestry has been using computers You don't smoke cigarettes for five generations and then the sixth one comes out and they can smoke all day because their lungs have evolved to be able to handle tobacco on a constant basis. That's just not how evolution works. (laughs) It is kind of how they say it works, actually. I don't think it happens at all, but they think that we've evolved into it and that they will be rapidly growing. He has some diagrams that I'll show you about uh, this exact thing. Uh, Kurzweil says that we invented language. I don't think that, I mean, even if it's true, we, other animals do have something of a language. Dolphins, gorillas, they have things that, and, and, you know, there's that gorilla Coco who learned how to do sign language. I've seen elephants paint with a paintbrush and and paint accurate paintings. That's, that's, that's language. It's not that we invented language. We had a necessity and a capacity. And therefore it happened. There was a need for it. It's as simple as that, in my opinion. Um, and, and like I said earlier, this, this falls into the line of faith, philosophy. Everything that's written is just coming from the word of the person. And it's not left for you to decide. He's telling you that we invented language. It's the wrong terminology whether it's true or not, in my opinion. I would check this book out, by the way. I really would, if you're even remotely worried about anything that I'm talking about. Um, Due to the inability to keep records, written or digital, other species cannot evolve their language, is his claim also, as far as other other animals having language. Um, It seems like it's necessity. They don't need video games. They're not going to make them. Maybe they could. I don't know. Their brains seem big enough. Um, Maybe they just don't have the opportunity or the want or the need. It's a very long-term and difficult discussion to have, obviously. But um, let me put up a few things that Ray Kurzweil notes where we have uh, Moore's Law, where essentially every 12 months transistors, chips, whatever you want to call them, can decrease in their surface area by 50% to do the same or greater. And as you'll see in a pick I took out of the book here, there you go. We have the proof. The proof is in the pudding. This book came out in 2000. Now, he also has something called the law of time and chaos. Essentially, Um, there's the law of increasing chaos and the law of accelerating returns. You can obviously take a pick of this and look at it yourself. There's actually more to it, but I gave you the meat of it. Um, As far as the law of increasing chaos, when chaos increases technologically, there is um, less technological evolution or biological, if you want to put it into those terms. This is by time. When there's more chaos, there's less evolution. I can agree with that. Law of accelerating returns. When there's more technological evolution per time. 
when when technology grows fast, it comes to a point where things get chaotic because markets get flooded and so on. And the amount of technology per, let's just say, year decreases eventually. Now, I'm showing this because it can be discussed as technological or biological, which I find fascinating. And a lot of these guys are, of course, proponents in the evolution thought and other things. But let's get to what could be <laughs> discussed as, potentially, evolution and chaos in general. What is the basis for all computer programs? Just like the U.S. Patent Office will not allow perpetual motion machines, computers don't just go. They require something. They require input. Input has changed drastically over the years. But remember, we're still dealing with binary ones and zeros. Input can be a keyboard. An input device can be a video game controller. An input device can be the, the fake keyboard on your phone. And an end input device can be your voice. If you speak to your phone and it reacts, that's input. And if you've been, let's just say you've been a video game player for the past 20, 30, 40 years, the input devices in the markets, the console video game market, have evolved. They've evolved steadily. At first, they only had digital pads, north, south, east, west. Then the diagonals were involved. Eight points. Then we turn to analog sticks, where there's a, not only anything within a circle, but there's different variations of speed from zero in the center to the outer, outer edge, where let's say if you're walking in a game, you can walk slowly or you can walk faster and push it up a bit. That's an evolution in input. It takes a lot more work, a lot more design technology, a lot more effort, a lot more processing power. Again, a lot more work to make something like that happen. Now, what's interesting to me about the voice input, this comes back to us all being cyborgs, is your phone always listening? People say, no, I have to say, hey, Siri, and then it listens. I'm smiling because I don't think it's anything near the truth, and that's what they would like you to think, of course. But as far as I learned, as far as my research, it is constantly recording, and it erases things right away, and it only checks like the past 10 seconds to make sure you didn't say, hey, Siri. And this is why your phone might respond thinking that you said it sometimes. Because it is recording everything you're saying. It just throws it all away, apparently. You can think whatever you want as far as that goes. I highly doubt it. So, what's the next evolution of input? Let's see. Where is Tesla going with all this stuff? And who funds Tesla, by the way? We'll get to that. This is called the Tesla suit. It has these interesting features such as climate control, an avatar system, nothing unexpected. Um, as you use things like this, you're going to have a headset on. You're going to have special gloves. That's just the way it works. So what is this here? This is the picture of the Neuralink from Tesla. If you don't know what the Neuralink is, it is definitely time to go look it up and give yourself a good little understanding of what it is and what it can be used for and what it's potentially going to be used for. I re specifically recall Elon Musk saying that, yes, we're going to be able to update the driver. We're going to be able to do software updates. How well do you think your brain is going to handle a software update? We are not computers. Something sits behind your ear and these little fibers go into your brain through the skull. It's a little scary, to say the very least. <laughs> if you're not familiar with a company named Tencent, 
I suggest that you do go check them out. It's a Chinese company. And they have a stake in lots of different things. Potentially the most would be video games. But they also have stake in movies, music. And actually, I think I wrote down uh, some of the more important... Here's, if you don't think Tencent is in your life, maybe you've seen a movie or some music from them. But... If you have kids who play video games, Tencent is definitely in your life. What does Tencent have stake in besides Tesla? Everything you just saw might be used for games from Tencent because they have stock in Tesla. Let me name a few things. One or two of these may be familiar. I'm going to name things that Tencent involved in. League of Legends. Epic Games. Epic includes uh, Fortnite. They make the Unreal Engine, which is just about everything at this point, apparently. Blizzard Activision, HBO, WeChat, Frontier Developments, Snapchat, Lego, Slamfire, Ubisoft. You must know at least three of the things I just said. You must, because we live in the same world same Western world. And for any fans listening outside of this country, what I just named were some pretty heavy hitters if you didn't grow up with those names. Think about that. Think about that. If your kid plays Fortnite, there is a Chinese influence. Now, China's best. I love the food. I love the culture. Russia is best. I love the food. I love the culture. I'm not saying anything bad about China. I'm not saying anything bad about Russia. They're both wonderful places with real, actual human beings like everywhere else. Flesh and blood like us. But as far as Chinese conglomerates who have a twin tower as their operating facility, I think it's in uh, Nanshan or something. I forgot the name. I'm sorry. But keep that in mind. They can actually dictate what your kids see in Fortnite. That very odd and easy to question rapper Travis Scott had a huge, you know, live concert inside of Fortnite. And as you guessed, he was wearing a spacesuit. And then not soon afterward, that very controversial concert he had, where he was almost seancing a dead person away from the crowd. I really do suggest you go look at it if you're not sure what I'm talking about. I'm not even going to provide a link. Anyone who wants to find that is going to find it on their own. It was... <laughs> not much disturbs me. It was pretty disturbing. It's odd. And he's, you know, probably a millionaire or whatever you want to call it. As if money is a real status thing. I doubt it. Um, So we're maybe getting to the end of this end. There are people that call themselves transhumanists. Whether they're transgender or not, they are all for the merging of mind and machine. Where, is it a soul anymore? Is it a physical? No. You're just uploaded on a cloud. You live forever. We will edit your genes so you can live forever. So I want to produce some footage and some ideas from somebody named Martine Rothblatt who, founder of Sirius XM, creator of Sirius XM, transhumanist, the head of United Therapeutics. They make medicine, of course. Now, maybe this medicine has saved a few lives, but there's way more to the story here. This person, as far as that overpopulation thing I meant earlier, this person is saying, you don't have to worry about it. We can send you out into the many areas of our solar system. There's plenty of room for all of us. Talk about spreading yourselves thin. A Mars facility, perhaps. A moon facility. Who knows what she's talking about? And not necessarily as she. This was Martin Rothblatt until he decided to become a woman. This person uh, wrote this book here called... The Apartheid of Sex, a manifesto on the freedom of gender. Freedom is a very good word, 
but in this particular um, setting here, I wouldn't necessarily say that um, this is freedom. The idea is that in this in this book, there are as many billion people as you can name in this world, and every single one of them can be their own gender. Billions of genders. Billions. There are two genders, and each one of them is required to make another life. And I would hope that that is very provable. But um, before I show a few things, why don't we just take a moment and I will show you a scene of her from a YouTube video called The Death of Death. A provocative uh, title indeed. All right, check this out. Uh, so what's your view of our ability to engineer around whatever those limits might be? Ray, I think we all have to be very skeptical about people who say that there are limits to what people can do. Human beings are the species that transcend their limits. And it was just a few decades ago that people said that humans would never break the sound barrier, that humans would not break into outer space. And it's the same thing with technological immortality. It's uh, just a concept that um, thousands of uh, teams of people throughout the world are working on. And I'm quite confident that we'll be able to transcend the barrier of disease and old age before the end of this century. Now, we have this outdated software that runs inside our bodies. It evolved thousands of years ago. Things were a little bit different then. The fat insulin receptor gene says, hold on to every calorie because you don't know where the next calorie is coming from. That was a good idea a thousand years ago. RNA interference just emerged a few years ago. We can turn genes off, and there are a thousand medications in the pipeline using that. Gene therapy, where we add new genes, has been around for a long time. So your company has been pioneering a, a new approach to gene therapy. Could you talk about that? Sure. The United Therapeutics approach to gene therapy is to take advantage of the fact that a replacement gene automatically finds its right spot within the three billion base pairs that, that make up our DNA. It's a, it's a magical property of the DNA, and it's almost as if nature is inviting us to help fix its, its bugs and its code. Check out that wording. Nature is inviting us to help fix its bugs or its code. The first thing is that we're discussing humans as robots, which is a big part of how they use their lingo to get you to almost be comfortable with it. Much like watching a movie that talks about this prepares you for something along the lines of it, and it makes you ready for it. And this is the power of entertainment. I really do believe it's called broadcasting for a reason. I really do think they're casting spells as they do this. Words are spells. You spell them, it is a spell. And it works every single time. When you speak to someone, you create imagery in their mind. It is automatically a spell, right? Not good or bad, it just is. It is the way it is. This is the proof that symbology can be even more impactful of a language than written words. And they often transcend language in different dialects in different parts of the world. Again, something to think about that um, is for sure. Um... I wanted to mention that transhuman was actually coined by um, Julian Huxley, who was an older brother of Thomas Huxley, who was right there for a good old Charles Darwin. I've seen his name being put up as the uh, Darwin's bulldog. So, he, you know, that, that family, the Huxley family, very interesting for sure. Definitely something to research. But for there to be an infinite number of genders... And then we talk about ourselves as computers. Are, do computers have different genders? Do computers have... If not, then we're already not able to produce a human being with this technology. But we can hack them? That host mentioned mRNA can turn genes off. Does that sound like a good idea? I don't think so. I don't think so. Um... Let's let's leave this. You've seen what that person has to say. There's many other ways for you to go check out more from Martine Rothblatt. 
there's way more ways for you to go check out more about the guy I put at the very beginning, Yuval Noah Harari. But I wouldn't have to convince you if I mentioned our current president. As I was doing research for this episode, this came up, and you'll see the date is September 12th from this year. This just happened. Executive Order on Advancing Biotechnology and Biomanufacturing Innovation for a Sustainable, Safe, and Secure American Bioeconomy. An executive order, because passing laws is just old hat at this point, <laughs> in all honesty. So now we have this, as you, you can read the whole thing for yourself, it's at whitehouse.gov. But um, for biotechnology and biomanufacturing to help us achieve our societal goals, the United States needs to invest in foundational scientific capabilities. I assume the foundational capabilities are there, and they clearly need to continue to fund them. I'm not sure how the wording works here. And that's just me being nitpicky and skeptical about the whole thing. And worried, by the way. We need to develop a genetic engineering technologies and techniques to be able to write circuitry for cells and predictably program biology in the same way in which we write software and program computers. Unlock the power of biological data including through computing tools and artificial intelligence, and advance the science of scale-up production while reducing the obstacles for commercialization so that innovation, innovative technologies and products can reach markets faster. Now, I don't know about you. Whoops, sorry about that. I don't know about you, but that, just that alone, and it's a pretty long order, Forget about me saying I'm scared or worried or whatever. Does this not make you think that all of this is way, way closer than we may think? The idea that you're just not going to be good enough? Or was the person who we heard at the very beginning, Harari, as he clearly states on his own, if you look at the bottom here, we do not need God, just technology. Or is it more like this? Taken from another article written by the uh, wonderful Leo Homan from um, a wonderful website, technocracy.news. Uh, Sorry about that. Now, fast forward to the early 21st century when we just don't need the vast majority of the population because the future is about developing more and more sophisticated technology like AI and bioengineering. Most people don't contribute anything to that except for their data and whatever people are still doing, which is useful. These technologies increasingly will make them redundant and will make it possible to replace the people. Am I taking this out of context? I don't think so. This man is clearly stating that you don't need to be here and technology is going to do the rest. Maybe your data will survive. Maybe your digital identity will go and stay on the cloud and be with us forever. Thank you for giving us that. Thank you for clicking agree over and over again. Maybe Moxie will teach your children to be just what they need for the future. Who knows what that is? They're going to live forever. They're going to gene edit themselves to live forever. They're going to boost their capabilities. I send a little billion or few or so nanobots inside of you so you can see farther, so you can be stronger, so you can live longer, so you can eat, live off of less food, so you don't have to plug in for more than two hours a day instead of five just to recharge. These people are not on our side, and they're always made to be seen in a, a very different light, almost a guiding, positive light. I disagree. 
And when you start reading all the things they say and start listening to all the things they say, they don't slip up. This is how they feel. This is what the World Economic Forum wants. Remember, you'll own nothing and be happy because we say so. Thanks so much for hanging out. Till the end of the video, I had a lot to say today. And um, I promise you I have way more to say, but I think that for this particular topic and where my mind was for today, I think this was good enough. Stay tuned for way more where that came from, interviews, episodes, and a bunch of other stuff here on Third Eye Edify Podcast. Thank you, and I'll see you guys soon.